Good evening, good evening, good evening. Welcome to everybody. Tonight's lesson is particle accelerators and relativistic mass. Now, ideally, what we want to get to is we want to get to the design of the accelerator at CERN, okay, which is called a synchrotron. It is the absolute dogs as far as it comes to um, accelerating particles. Before we get there, we've got to go through some little stages, and we've got to understand why we want to do this in the first place. And there's a couple of reasons. Reason one is dead simple, that if you have an object and you would like to see what is inside that object, um, one of the best ways to do that is to fire another object at it and smash it open. Okay, the idea being that you will smash this thing open, all its random bits and bobs will go every which way, and you can measure those bits and bobs and see what they're made of. Okay, this is the fundamental kind of visceral child taking apart a radio concept except you're not taking apart the radio the radio with a screwdriver you're taking it apart with a shotgun if you can accelerate a particle fast enough you can hit stuff with it and that's important okay from a medical point of view you can accelerate stuff for cancer treatments you can do all sorts of fun things with accelerated particles but for theory for experimental physicists like ourselves breaking stuff is kind of cool it gets better though if i take uh, a particle Let's fill this one in a little bit. Let's give it a fill color, call it red. If I take a particle and I accelerate it um, and send it through a pretty dense material, okay, so there's lots and lots and lots of other particles there. It may smash into it and break them open, and that's super duper interesting. But what may also happen is that as it comes through, it kind of skims by one of them and slows down. All right, in uh, much the same way as we did with, um, with X-ray production last year in lower sick, um, because we slow down, we have to emit some energy because we lose kinetic energy. And energy can't be created and it can't be destroyed. So what happens is that these energies can come off. Now, sometimes they come off as X-rays, sometimes they come off as gamma rays. But if you get it just right, those energies can actually become some degree of mass. Because remember, E equals mc squared. And that's going to be a major trope of tonight's lesson. Okay, E equals mc squared is important. Because if I give some energy off here, it's possible that I can get some mass. So sometimes I'll not just get photons coming off here and gamma rays and things like that. Sometimes I'll get particles. And if I'm super, super lucky, I might get a charged particle. Say something like an electron okay, with an E minus. But because of the fact that my accelerated particle lost energy but did not lose charge... I will have to create, along with it, another particle that will have the opposite charge to my electron. And this would be a positron. And this is antimatter. So particle accelerators are useful for all sorts of things, ranging from medical purposes to breaking things open to see what they're made of, to generating matter-antimatter pairs, and really understanding what was happening in the early universe and giving us a really good understanding of how things work. Okay, so what we need to do is we simply need to take a particle. And by particle, I mean anything from an electron all the way up to a very, very heavy um, atomic nucleus. Okay, we can take a particle and we want to make it go fast. Now, go fast is a relative term. You know, 100 miles an hour might be considered to be fast. Uh, but when we're talking about fast in these situations, we're going to think, do things like 0.2c, where 0.2c is 20% of the speed of light. So we're going to be going very, very fast. And to get very, very fast, we need to accelerate these objects and we need to build accelerators. All right, so let's get into our very first basic accelerator in terms of what we can actually go about building. And the first one that we're going to try and build is something called a linear accelerator. Okay, or a LINAC for short. Linear accelerator. Okay, this was um, this was kind of first uh, kind of theorized in 1924 by a guy called Gustav Ising. Uh, it was built in 1928, which is pretty impressive if you think back to the um, technological availability uh, in uh, 1928. But the, the idea is pretty simple. Um, that The basic idea of accelerating a particle is let's get ourselves our particle 
uh, let's say it's charged in some respect. So let's get a charged particle. Um, if we're doing a nucleus, it's probably positively charged. Does that seem reasonable? All right. What we're going to do then is we're going to put a plate here that's positively charged over here. And then we're going to put a plate over somewhere else that is negatively charged. It right. doesn't get much simpler than that. Okay, so we go bang. The little particle here is repelled away from the positive and attracted towards the negative and smashes into it. Okay, that's not ideal. So let's uh, let's make a hole in our little negative plate. Okay, so that our particle can get accelerated towards it. But if we get it just right, it'll squeeze through here. All right. Now the problem with that is that as soon as it squeezes through this little gap, let's make this gap big enough for it to actually squeeze through is as soon as it gets through here, well, this is a negative plate, isn't it? So it's going to start decelerating this object. So that's it. You've had your gettings. You, you get the accelerator across two plates. So let's see if we can't do a little bit better. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with um, a cylinder. And next to that cylinder, I'm going to place another cylinder. And then next to that cylinder, I'm going to place another cylinder. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to charge this cylinder positive. So let's give all. Actually, do you know what? We'll start with, well, since we're using positive physics, we'll start with negative. We'll charge this negative. Okay, um, and then we'll have this one charge positive. And then we'll have this one charge negative. Now I hear you cry, why or why or why would we have the middle one uh, charged as positive? Because if we're sending a positive particle in here, this makes no sense whatsoever. Surely we'd want the whole thing to be negative all the time. And you're absolutely right. Unfortunately, getting something negatively charged is actually quite difficult. And we don't necessarily always want it to be negatively charged. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect this one here and this one down here to the negative side of a power supply like that and this one here because I've got a power supply and a power supply has a positive and negative side I'm going to connect this one to my positive all right so this is in the background I'll maybe fade that out a bit and make light gray or something there we go. so the idea is this that my little particle will come flying along here and enter into this hollowed out cylinder. Okay, the reason it's going to come flying along here is because it feels this massive negative charge. Go boom, through here. When it emerges from here though, what I want to happen is I want it to accelerate across this gap. And this is why I don't just have this one negative. Because if this was negative and this was negative, then there would be no acceleration across this gap. It would just be, you know, this is just as charged as this, and this is closer, so I'm going to slow down and then kind of come through here, and then nothing's going to happen in here, and it's terrible. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect this to an AC source. All right, now watch this. As the particle comes flying in here, it gets accelerated because it feels this negative attraction. Whilst it's traveling along in here, though, because AC periodically changes from being positive to negative, then what happens is that this first one, whilst it's traveling inside, becomes positive. The second one becomes negative, and this third one becomes positive as well. Get rid of that. So as it emerges, my positively charged object, remember it was positive, red for positive, gets pushed away from here and accelerated into this one. Okay, then it travels inside this one, and whilst it's inside this one, the AC source changes again, which changes this one to positive, the one that's inside becomes positive, and the other two become negative. So that by the time it reaches the end, again, we have a positive charge here and a negative charge here, so it gets repelled away from the from the um, from this cylinder and attracted towards this cylinder. So every single time it comes out of these cylinders, we have an acceleration, okay, and these are called acceleration gaps. 
Is that okay? So far, so good. So we get acceleration as it travels between these two gaps because of the fact that there is a difference in charge. In fact, there's a difference in voltage. There is a potential difference. So if we have this one at, say, negative 200 volts, and this one then at positive 200 volts, then we have a potential difference across these two of 400 volts. Now, remembering that energy is equal to QV, okay, the charge times voltage, then what we can say is that every time we have a particular charged object with a particular voltage applied to it, it's going to gain some degree of, it's going to have some amount of work done on it, it's going to gain some amount of kinetic energy, it's going to get faster. So this is awesome. But why am I saying that it only accelerates across these gaps? Surely when it's inside the cylinder, it's accelerating also. Well, it's actually not. And in order to have a look at that, we're going to have a little look inside as we send our particle in. Okay, so here's my here's my um, my little tube. Let's have it charged up. Let's charge it negatively. Okay, so this is a this is an isolated conductor. It's been charged up, and then in this comes. You would imagine that because it's traveling through here and it's inside something negative, that it will continue to accelerate. But let's take a look down this way. So let's take a cross-sectional view. So let's imagine I'm looking into the cylinder, right? And my little particle is in the middle with its charge Q, whatever that happens to be. And it's traveling, let's say, into the page. So we put a little dot to represent traveling into the page. So it's traveling away from us. Well, what's the charge on the exterior of this? Well, what we could say is, and there's a couple of ways of explaining this, but we'll start with this. Let's say that the charge is negative all the way around, because this is a cylinder. It's basically a stretched out circle. So there's no reason to suggest that there's more charge one place than another. In fact, that would be silly, because this is an isolated conductor. The charge will spread out over the whole conductor in order to be even. Right, so my positive charge here, so we'll call this plus Q just to make sure that we understand that. My positive charge Q is going to be attracted to this little negative over here. But it's also going to be attracted to this one, and 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 to this one. It's going to be completely attracted in all directions at all times. And what happens is when we do the vector summation in any particular direction we like, the force one way cancels with the force the other way, and overall we have that there is zero net force acting on my object as it travels through here. Okay, the result is that it's not speeding up, but it's equally not slowing down. It's just kind of drifting through. That's one way to put it. The other way to put it is that if you imagine the entire surface of our object, let's say it was charged to 6 volts, which it wouldn't be, but um, 6s are nice and you know, handy numbers to work with, then everywhere along here would be 6 volts. So there would be 6 volts, and over here would be 6 volts, and over here would be 6 volts, and so forth. Well then, why would a charge move? Remember, in order to have charges move, you need a potential difference. Okay, Charges move from one place to another. They move from high potential to low potential. But if I decided to move from this 6 volts to that 6 volts, well, why would I? Because it would be equally valid for me to move that way to that way. There's no potential difference. Okay? Um, Donald asks, is there any way it could be pulled apart by the forces involved? Probably not. Remember how strongly held together particles are. Now, we're trying to accelerate this thing to a good fraction of the speed of light to smash it into something to maybe have a look at what's inside of it. So the likelihood of us being able to develop a voltage that will just rip it apart. Like, you can develop voltages to rip apart molecules, certainly. But to rip apart actual atoms, not likely. Not likely. Okay, so any given direction is as likely as any other given direction. There's no potential difference, and therefore, there is no acceleration in any given direction. Again, my particle just drifts through. And these are called, therefore, drift tubes. Simple. Okay. They drift along here, and then when they come out the other side, they accelerate across the gap. 
Okay, so the logical solution then is to make these drift tubes um, as short as you humanly can. So they come in, they stay nice and short, they go into the drift tube for a little minute, just long enough for me to change over my AC voltage from positive to negative, and then pop out the other side, change from, positive, uh, from negative to positive, out the other side, just long enough for it to go along here. The problem is, is we get higher and higher and higher in speed. Uh, let, let's actually do a little diagram of that. So I'll start off with a drift tube that sort of looks a bit like this. Okay, a little short one. We'll leave this out of the way. So drift tube one. Move that for now. And uh, let's get another one in here. So let's get a longer one. Drift tube two. And then we'll go on to drift tube three. Now I've just put in a longer drift tube. Well, why? Well, why would you do that? I just said we want to keep these as short as possible. But there is a very small problem. The small problem comes in the equation speed equals distance over time. Now, this is like an equation we learned way back in probably first year um, when we arrived at secondary school. And it's come to haunt us here. Because the time here is the time it takes for me to change my AC supply. So let's say I've got a really good AC supply. So AC supply changes every, let's give it not point, not, not one second. That's pretty good, isn't it? You know, like we're going to check, we've got a, that's a thousand hertz okay, in terms of a frequency. Now, considering that um, AC out of a wall is 50 hertz, you know, that we're being very, very, very generous here. All right. Then what needs to happen is that my little particle needs to stay in the drift tube for 0.001 seconds. Okay? Now, here's the problem. Rearrange speed equals distance over time to distance equals speed multiplied by time. All right, so the distance is how long does my drift tube have to be? My time is fixed, so my distance is equal to whatever my speed is times 0 0.001. And then we've got the problem that the distance becomes proportional to my speed. So my distance is then proportional to my speed. So as my speed goes up, the distance goes up. The length of my drift tube has to go up because it needs to stay in it for 0.001 seconds. But in this drift tube, it's say traveling quite slowly. So in 0.001 seconds, it will cover this distance. But in this drift tube, it's moving faster. So in 0.001 seconds, it will cover a greater distance. And this is the limitation of a LIMAC because this drift tube is short. This drift tube is longer. By extension, then, the next drift tube will have to be longer again. And as we get faster and faster and faster, my linear accelerator, which is in a straight line, gets longer and longer and longer. And very rapidly, we have a problem that we run out of lab. Okay, so Matthew's asking, uh, we're not sticking it to the, um, to end up with some tubes accidentally decelerating the particle because of changing at the wrong time. Uh, yes, so basically, if you don't, if you don't uh, make each successive drift tube the correct length, then what happens is that the that your particle arrives out of its drift tube before you've changed from positive to negative. So you end up with a deceleration gap or you end up just knocking the thing off one way or the other. You don't get an accelerator. You get um, an object that a particle may or may not move down, which, which might be fun, but not really what we're after here. Okay, so we need to make this thing progressively longer and longer and longer and longer and longer. And that's an issue. Now, to give you an idea of how much of an issue this is, all right, let's go back to our original design here. Okay, we'll keep these at the size they are. If we have our AC supply um, being radio frequency, okay, now radio frequency AC supplies are buildable. Uh, they will give you frequencies in the kind of kilohertz to megahertz range. So let's give ourselves um, let's give ourselves a reasonable frequency of say a hundred thousand hertz. All right, so that's pretty major. Okay, we're changing 100,000 times every second, okay? which gives me then the time in the drift tube, T, is equal to um, 1 over 100,000. 
seconds. All right. So we can use our equation, distance equals speed multiplied by time. So the distance or the length of my dress tube has to be whatever my speed is um, multiplied by 1 over 100,000. Now that would be quite nice actually. Okay, you're thinking, well, we're going to divide, whatever our length has to be, it's just our speed divided by 100,000. The issue is, say we want to go at 20% the speed of light, so 0.2c times 1 over 100,000. Well, let's put that into our calculator. So c is equal to 3 by 10 to the power of 8. Okay, multiply that by 0.2. Which gives us, you know, what about 600,000, something like that there, or 600 million, or 60 million, that's better. Divide that by 100,000, and we get a distance of 600 meters. Because we've got, half a, we've got over half a kilometer for a drift tube. Again, you might think, well, 600 meters isn't too far, it's not too bad. You know, like you're thinking about a running track stretched out, and then half again. That's long, but it's not inconceivably long but remember your particle is going to spend one one hundred thousandth of a second in that before it needs the next tube which will also have to be more than 600 meters and it will then spend one one hundredth of a thousand and that's just one drift tube you have to write on that's just one drift tube so the next one and the next one and the next one and the next one gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and rapidly your linear accelerator becomes pretty useless for getting things to go extremely fast especially light particles pretty good actually at accelerating heavy particles um, but not so good at accelerating light particles because um, because the lighter particles will um, will accelerate less well across gaps because e equals qv and their q is very small so their increase in kinetic energy is less across each voltage jump Okay, so it's pretty good at actually at accelerating heavy stuff, but with large charge, but not so good at accelerating smaller stuff. So our problem is one of space. Uh, what 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 uh, speed do you usually need the particle at in real life? Well, that's a that's a that's a really good question, Matthew. It's kind of like asking the question, how much money do you really need in real life? And the answer is more. Okay, that's that's the general answer. So if I can get it to point to uh, C inside a linear accelerator, you can guarantee I've got an experiment that has 0.3 C as a requirement and I need to build more, I need to build more, I need to build more because I want to test and push the boundaries. So whilst a linear accelerator might be good for certain speeds, um, it's not going to get us to really, really interesting high-end speeds where we want to investigate these E equals MC squared stuff and we want to make ourselves some matter antimatter pairs. So our problem is one of, of, of space. Essentially, like this is this theory works. We just don't have enough straight line space. So the obvious answer, if I asked you to go and run for 20 kilometers, yet you can't go more than one kilometer away from your house, the logical process would be to build some form of loop. Okay, if you build a loop round and round and round and round, round, you could theoretically keep this thing accelerating and accelerating and accelerating. All right, um, and this is uh, this was the problem that we got. Okay, and we end up with something called a cyclotron that we that um, that scientists built essentially a large loop to send the thing round and round and round in. Okay, uh, an American physicist actually called Ernst Lawrence um, did this. Uh, he built it in 1929-1930. Actually, he won a Nobel Prize for it in 1939, and he built a system called a cyclotron. Now, it's a, I like the name. I just love the name here. Now, you don't need to know too much about this if you're doing the CA course, but it, it does kind of go into what we've got. Right? And the game is this. We use um, two kind of semicircular or 3D semicircular disks. Right? And they're going to be my charged plates. Okay, so they're my, they're my Linac drift tubes. Okay, they're going to be connected again to my radio frequency AC supply. Okay, so we'll pop our little things in there, and then we'll put radio frequency AC. So that means we're getting, you know, at any given instance, say this one's negative and this one's positive. 
but let, let's call it one uh, let's call it a thousand of a second but thousand of a second later it switches okay, that's the game and the idea being that if we put our little particle in between these two things then when one's positive and the other is negative if we time it right we go boom, across here right, our problem is that particles travel in straight lines Newton's laws an object would remain at rest or continue to travel at constant speed in a straight line unless acted on by an unbalanced force. And we've just said that when it's inside some form of hollow object like this, it's going to be acted on by no force, so it's just going to go and smash into the side. So we need to apply an external force. So let's do that. Let's get rid of this and put in a nice magnetic field traveling through it. Okay? Because if we apply a magnetic field that is perpendicular to the direction of travel of a charge, then we will get a force that's mutually perpendicular to that. We all remember that. Of course we do. Of course we do. Everybody remembers that if I have a charge and a magnetic field in perpendicularity with each other, then we will get a force that's mutually perpendicular to those two, don't we? Yes? Well, we better because it's, it's Fleming's left hand law. It's the FBI Okay, and I can I can sense you all around the all around the country now, holding up your left hand with your forefinger out and your middle finger heading to the left and your thumb pointing upwards because I'm doing it right now. Okay, and what it looks like is this in a kind of two D version. Um, that if you have your um, your forefinger here in blue pointing into the screen, and your thumb your force pointing upwards, your current should be pointing that way. Just get your left hand out and make sure that, that is true. Because we're going to go from a 3D diagram here, by the way, do you like the production quality? Uh, my PowerPoint drawing skills are getting better. They couldn't have got much worse, let's not lie. And let's bring in a little 2D representation of this, which is a little bit easier to work with. All right, so um, let's have our magnetic field going into the page because that makes life a little bit easier for us. So our magnetic field is a little cross into the page, okay? So our field is like this. Okay? And I'm going to rotate my cyclotron around a bit. Let's roll you about around a bit because that makes life a little bit easier for us as well. Okay, so my magnetic field goes into the page and is everywhere, okay? I've just drawn two X's, but there could be X's absolutely everywhere. And let's have ourselves a little charged particle Positive charge here. That has been somehow caused to at least start moving in here. I'd like to pick those two up. There we go. Okay, so it's going to come across like this. Okay, so let's say it's moving in this direction. Okay. Now, what can you tell me about the direction of the force? Well, I've got a field going into the page. I've got a current that's going this way. And I should have done that green. Okay, because a, char a positively charged particle moving in any given direction is a current in that direction. Yep, so as soon as it moves this way, it experiences a force. And that force is going to be in the upward direction. Like that. Agreed? Hope so. Now, the force that's applied to it will cause it to change direction because that's how it works. Yeah, that's what forces do. So it's going to change and maybe come a little bit like this as it travels across. But now, rotate your left hand slightly. The field still goes straight into the page, but now my current is slightly diagonally upwards, which means that my force is now also slightly slanty because it has to remain at right angles to the current. And what we'll find is that as we continue to go around here, the force causes the current to change direction, which causes the force to change direction. And at any given time, what you'll have is that the velocity of my object is such that it causes the force to be pointing towards the center. Or at least that's what we want to do. We want to make circular motion because Circular motion means I can have this thing go round and round and round and round and round in loop after loop after loop after loop. And every time it does so, it needs to get accelerated across this gap. So it goes, 
right, by my radio frequency AC supply, which is great. Now, that's not bad. That's not bad. Now, the force that's acting on a particularly charged part on a charged particle that is um, finds itself moving at speed v inside a magnetic field of, uh, of of b is equal to f equals b q v. All right. If it is able to describe a circle, then it must satisfy the equation for centripetal force that f is equal to m v squared over r. Do we all agree with that? Those two things must be true. If this is true, okay, if it's a uniform magnetic field that's acting and it's moving at speed v, and if it's traveling in a circle, which is what we want, then we have to make this true, that f equals mv squared over r. So put those two things equal to each other, and we get that bqv is equal to mv squared over r. Okay, so um, Donald says, sir, I have to go to a respirator mask fitting now. Will this be available on your channel, uh, on your channel to watch afterwards? I'm glad to hear that you're that you're helping out during these uh, difficult times. Yes, this will absolutely be available. Uh, thanks so much for coming along, Donald. I will see you later. So we've got BQV equals MV squared over R. So what we can do is we can cancel V on both sides. We're going to multiply both sides by R because like nobody likes divided by's to give me that BQR is equal to MV. Happy enough. Okay, where B is the magnetic field strength, Q is the charge of my particle, R is the radius of the circle, uh, M is its mass, and V is its velocity. Okay, so let's let's set some things out as constant. Okay, so the um, let's assume that the magnetic field that I'm producing is constant. Okay, I've got I've got a magnet set up to be as strong as I possibly can. Let's assume the charge of my object is positive, which makes sense. And let's assume that its mass is also constant. This sort of makes sense, but will become an issue um, a little bit later on. What we then end up with is that R is proportional to V. That as the speed gets larger, the radius of my circle gets larger. And this is going to have to be true anyway a little bit later. But we have an issue that we can't just indefinitely have this thing travel round and round and round. What happens is we start in the center and on nice low speeds at the start as it accelerates, we've got low radius. V is small and R is small. But as V gets larger, the radius of my circle also necessarily gets larger. This is like the if you spin something, if you put something on a on a spinning turntable and you start to spin it and spin it and spin it and spin it, and spin it, it starts to gradually make its way further out to the edges, and eventually it comes out at an edge. That's actually sort of useful because eventually we want to get this thing out. Like eventually we want our particle to come out and hit a target at the end here, say, so that we can smash it into stuff. That, that's actually a design. It's, it's not a bug, it's a feature, as they say in programming terms. But uh, it, we'd ideally like to be able to control when that is, not just there's a set V. Because we still have sort of the same problem that we have with our Linac, that if we want really, really, really large speeds, we need really, 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 really large radius circles. So therefore, we need really, 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 really big cyclotrons. Now, because it's a circle, it's not quite as space ridiculous as a Linac. And as a result, this is definitely an upgrade. Okay, so it's definitely an upgrade. It's definitely better. We also have the other problem, which is, do you remember our little radio frequency AC supply? Even if this wasn't an issue, it would be an issue. Because if we have our supply frequency, I'm just going to grab this one from over here, I think, rather than try and draw this. Now we say that. One over. It would have been faster to draw it, wouldn't it? It really would have been faster to draw it. One more time. Yeah, there we go. That if I have my AC supply changing, say, once every, we'll, we'll call it once every 10 seconds, just, just for the for the sake of um, ease, but it's not. It's like once every 10,000th of a second, 100,000th of a second, but it's a difficult word to say. So one every 10 seconds. Then what we have 
is we have a time period for our rotation is equal to a tenth of a second. Okay, and that means that the time it takes to do a full rotation around its circle um, has to equal a tenth of a second. Okay, or at the very least, the time it takes to do half a circle is equal to a tenth of a second. It needs to change polarities whilst it's inside this D. So half of that distance has to be covered in that, which means that since T equals 2 pi um, over omega, 2 pi uh, over omega, then since t is a constant and pi is a constant, omega, the angular speed, has to remain a constant. Okay, But v equals r omega. Oh, I'm in the wrong font. Let's try that again. Since v equals r omega, if omega remains a constant, as v increases, r increases anyway. So we're done both ways. We, we have no choice in this matter that if we want this object to get faster and faster and faster and faster, we have to make it bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Unless we come and take a look at some of these assumptions. That Q is a constant and there's not much we can do about that. And M is a constant also. And there's not much we can do about that. Um, at the very least, if it's not a constant, it's not, a, it's not something that's under our control. But this one here, B is a constant, is under our control. That if we could gradually ramp up B as time goes on, if we could vary B, then it wouldn't be R is proportional to V. It would be BR is proportional to V, which could mean that we keep R the same if we could gradually increase B with respect to V. Now, I don't mean gradually. If I double V, I'm going to double B. And we're going to top out in terms of our ability to use huge magnetic fields because of just the mechanical difficulties of making really strong magnetic fields. But we've got a, we've got a way forward here. We can improve the design of this system in a heartbeat by just saying, as V goes up, let's increase the strength of our magnet. And whilst we're at it, we need to solve this problem here as well. Because it's no good solving this problem that we can go, all right, cool, we can, we can have that not dependent. But this is still an issue. That V equals R omega has to be a thing. Otherwise, this thing doesn't accelerate properly. So we have to challenge this assumption over here that T is a constant. T can't be a constant. So we're going to need to be able to vary the time which means that we're going to need a variable frequency power supply. Okay, So instead, we're going to make two improvements. Two improvements. The right form. One, we're going to vary the magnetic field. And two, we are going to use a variable frequency power supply and that sounds easy but it really 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 isn't because once you get to very high speeds the rate at which these things need to vary on any form of sensible size becomes extremely difficult to do but it can be done and it's done by building an object that can synchronize the magnetic field, the variable frequency that you need, and the speed. And that is why it is called a synchrotron. And it looks basically something like this. That we have the features of a cyclotron, which has a curved path, and a linac, which has drift tubes that are straight. As we go around the loop, there's one particular section, this one here, that is designated for accelerating the object. Okay, So in here, we're going to stick our variable computer-controlled, highly adaptable variable power supply. Okay, So we can adapt this, but we need some serious computing power to do this. Okay, So we can adapt the frequency here. As we go through here, there is a magnetic field 
B. Okay, so we come out here screaming at, let's say, 10% the speed of light. We have a magnetic field B that knows that a 10% the speed of light object is coming, so therefore adjusts its strength so that it follows a curved path that has a radius that is the radius of this arc of a circle, R. And then because we're not complete and utter sadists, or complete and utter masochists, I should say, you know, we might be sadists, but we don't want to hurt ourselves. So as my particle travels its way around here, okay, it comes screaming through here, it then gets moved into this drift tube and pulled through this arc, which has the same strength B over here, and then drifts around here, which has the same strength B and the same radius, and ideally around here, which has the same strength and the same radius, at its most basic, until we arrive back here and are accelerated. Okay? During this time, my magnetic field increases in strength and keeps this object within this loop. It accelerates and B increases, and it comes round and it accelerates and B increases, and it accelerates and B increases. The time taken for one of these loops gets uh, progressively smaller and smaller and smaller. So it goes faster and faster and faster and faster. But because my radio frequency supply is keeping up, I'm still having the plus minus happening at the right time for it to accelerate across this gap. And because my uh, magnetic field keeps strengthening up, I stay on this path and stay contained within this. And this is the basis of a synchrotron. Now you can have different sections and uh, make this less of a square shape and make it more into a um, donut shape, which is a really good idea because you have less extreme curves that way that the whole system is a system of short straight sections followed by slightly curved, followed by a short straight section, followed by a slight curve, followed by a short straight section, followed by a slight curve, and so forth. But the basic principle is this. And once we've got that up and running, we can get objects up to extremely high speeds. All right, And once we do, we run into a little bit of a problem. Do you remember that we said that M was a constant? Turns out that at very high speeds, it isn't. That the mass changes, or appears to change, or behaves as if it changes, as the object gets faster and faster. And this is a term that we call relativistic mass. And this is our second part of our learning. Okay, so relativistic mass, um, it, it's a bit of a misnomer. The idea is that the mass changes as you get faster and faster. And that's weird, yes, that's relativity. Um, or at least it's the, it's, the, it's the start of relativity. That It matters, it matters. So as we get faster and faster and faster, um, some people would say that your mass increases. That's not quite right, um, but, but we're getting there. So let's take ourselves back to round about third, fourth year, and we introduced this equation. And in this equation, P equals MV. It should be a nice, comfortable, memorable equation for us. It should be, anyway. Uh, that the momentum of an object is equal to its mass multiplied by its velocity. And it works really, really, really well. Uh, it's, it's just a little bit unfortunate that it's wrong. Okay. That it's actually true to say that the momentum is equal to uh, something called gamma times m times v. All right. Now, it's, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal for general day-to-day -day stuff. No, because um, gamma, in almost all situations that you're ever going to run into, is so close to 1 that you may as well not bother about it. Okay? But it, it's going to matter, because we want to use this to define what mass is. Because it's really quite hard to tell you what is mass. So it's better to describe it in terms of mass is equal to your momentum divided by your velocity. All right? And your momentum is a measurement of how difficult it is to get you stopped. 
Yeah, we've sort of got an, an idea with that. So as my mask goes up, um, it becomes progressively more difficult to stop me. It's actually a little bit more correct to say that your, moment, your mass is actually a measurement of the energy found within you. That E is equal to mc squared is the mass energy equivalence, which means that E over C squared is equal to m. And that should come as a little bit of a surprise to you because it means that there's nothing intrinsically massy about mass. That if you know the energy of the object and you divide it, I mean all the energy, contained within the object, if you obliterated it from existence, um, how much energy would, would be a gap? You converted all the mass in that object into energy, you would get E. But that means that mass is just energy, measurement of the energy that it has, okay? So, um, and as I increase my momentum, I increase my energy. Because I'm increasing my velocity, I'm getting more and more kinetic energy. Is that right? Now, uh, that, this then little Gamma here becomes important because I want to define mass in terms of momentum. Now, gamma is close to 1 because gamma is something called the Lorentz factor. Um, and it's equal to 1 over square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. Okay, so we'll let that percolate for a little bit. But essentially, for almost all situations, the velocity of any object squared divided by the speed of light squared tends towards zero. This is very, very small, usually. Now, if you're not happy with that, pop a couple of numbers into your calculator, like do 25 squared divided by 300 million squared, um, and your calculator will basically return zero to you. So I end up with gamma is equal to 1 over the square root of 1, which is 1. So gamma equals 1 over 1, which is 1, and we sort of ignore it which is pretty good. That's classical Newtonian mechanics allows you to ignore gamma in this situation. But we're building accelerators, and we're building accelerators where V is going to get up to something that looks like C. All right, so let's try that out. Uh, is this why it is supposed to be impossible to go at the speed of light, or it proves that? You know, um, yeah, it's a consequence of this, yes. Certainly, it is an issue that as we get at they just put C in here immediately. And what do we get? We get 1 minus C squared over C squared. We get 1. Uh, let, let's do that. If that becomes C, we get 1 minus 1 on the bottom line. We get the square root of 1 minus 1, which is 0. And that's fine. We can solve that. But then we end up with gamma is equal to 1 over 0, which is undefined. And before that, it was tending upwards. So it's undefined in the direction of infinitely large. And then we end up with an object that's traveling at the speed of light has infinitely large momentum, which makes it infinitely difficult to stop. And the converse there, you'd, you'd sort of imagine is true as well, that if it was infinitely difficult to stop, it's infinitely difficult to get up to that speed, though those two things don't necessarily follow. Okay, so um, that out of the way, that out of the way, let's have a look at what happens here. That as I increase my velocity, so I can measure my velocity directly, oh, up it goes, then um, my mass remains constant. Okay, yeah, like we didn't get fatter or thinner or anything like that there. But as this, as my velocity goes up, this factor gamma goes up. And let's just do a little, little sample calculation of that at, let's say, 50% the speed of light, 50% c. We end up with gamma equals 1 over 1 minus v squared over c squared. That becomes 0 0.5 c, and then that becomes all squared. So go grab your calculator, and let's actually put this in. Um, I'm going to put it in, in my calculator. So we're going to have uh, one takeaway, then bracket. We want on the top line 0 0.5 times, if I press 0, that would be double 0 0.5 times 3 by 10 to the 8. Close that bracket and square it. 
because it's a half c all squared, divided by 3 by 10 8 squared, which gives me a bottom line of something really irritating. In fact, I've pressed the wrong button. So that's annoying. So 0 0.5 c, that's 0 0.25 c squared. C squared's cancel, so it's like 0 0.75. So we want root 0 0.75, and uh, we get 0 0.86. So we get gamma is equal to 1 over 0 0.86. So gamma, oh, try that again, is equal to 1 over that, which is 1.15. Oh, who cares? Who cares? What does that mean? Well, it means that for an object traveling at 0 0.5 the speed of light, it's actually got 15% more momentum than it should do because gamma here becomes 1.15 instead of 1. So I end up with a little bit extra momentum. Now, since I'm able to measure my speed, I classically thinking don't put this as part of this. I say, well, what's happened is that some of that energy is now being expressed in the mass. And this is what we call relativistic mass. That we say that the relativistic mass, m subscript r, is equal to um, gamma, the Lorentz factor, multiplied by the rest mass, the mass that it was going at when gamma was 1, the mass it was going at before we started going really fast. Okay, so my relativistic mass is equal to gamma m0, which gives me um, a quick rearrangement of this equation just gives me that m relativistic, m subscript r, is equal to all of this, but instead of 1 on the top line, we have m subscript o. And this is my relativistic mass equation. That, relativistically speaking, the relativistic mass is equal to the rest mass divided by root 1 over that. Okay? Um, and that's what we mean by relativistic mass. It's Probably wrong to say that an object gets heavier as it gets faster, okay? Because it's it's not developing any extra stuff. What it is doing though is it's taking on board more energy, and that energy is not being expressed as speed, okay? And therefore we reason that it's being expressed as mass, but it's not quite as simple as that. Okay. Anyway, relativistic mass is the consequence of the momentum equation, and basically, actually, uh, loads of equations being wrong, um, and needing to have this factor, this Lorentz transformation um, factor, involved in it. Uh, it turns out time is exactly the same that you get that as an object travels faster, time ticks more slowly, um, and it's got to do with the fact that that um, that t for the observer, um, t observed, is equal to um, the Lorentz factor gamma multiplied by t for somebody that's stationary. Okay, so it's um, it's weird. It's weird. You get what's called time dilation, but that's neither here nor there. This is relativistic mass. And what you need to understand is that as an object gets faster, it appears to gain mass and this mass we call the relativistic mass and the relativistic mass can be calculated using this equation that at low speeds the relativistic mass and the rest mass are the same but like even at 50 percent the speed of light there's only a 15 percent discrepancy the problem is that the graph that as we go along here, that if we have um, the ratio of rest mass to um, kind of normal mass, or and we started at one down here, the graph sort of goes and ground and ground and ground, round about one, round about one, round about one, come on up a bit, come on up a bit, come on up a bit, and then like then takes off, and it's asymptotic at C, so you get a real takeoff. Right, so once you get to about 95% uh, of the speed of light, you know, you're looking at 
factors of, of above two here that you're suddenly behaving as if you're twice as heavy. Is that right? And um, again, the problem is with that, that you have additional momentum. And if you end up with infinite momentum, you have the problem that well, momentum and kinetic energy are, are connected to each other. So if you have infinite momentum, um, did you need infinite kinetic energy to get you there? And if you have infinite kinetic energy, then, well, the universe isn't infinite. There is a finite amount of energy in the universe. So can you actually get there? Okay. I um, hope this was helpful to you. Uh, we're at 55 minutes of pretty serious um, accelerator stuff. I haven't stopped talking the whole time. Um, you guys have been an excellent audience. It's been wonderful to see people in the, in the live chat. Um, if you can give me a like and a subscribe, that would be super, super helpful. Um, just makes me feel nice because I get to see numbers afterwards. And uh, all that really remains for me to say is that, once again, never, ever, ever forget that physics rocks. It's true.